Hello and welcome to New Frontiers on CCTV International. I'm Ji Xiaojun in Beijing. And today we're continuing with our major series, Tracing the History of Chinese Civilization. The series sets out to illustrate the evolution of Chinese civilization through an investigation of archaeological discoveries, historical sites and cultural relics. In today's program, we are going back to China's last imperial dynasty, the Qing Dynasty. Under the Qing Dynasty, China's territory was larger than at any time previously, and its civilization reached new heights. However, in the middle of the 17th century, the country was ravaged by warfare and flooding, and the newly established Qing Dynasty was facing a dire situation. The imperial court was forced to resort to desperate measures in order to consolidate its power. It was an era in which different ethnic groups in China fused on a scale hitherto unknown, and one in which China's territory was larger than at any other time in her history. China was by this time the most populous country and the strongest economic entity in the East, and she had already produced many immortal cultural classics, among them the longest book in the world. It was also in this era that the nation's various ethnic groups reached a consensus on what constituted a national culture. This was the age of the Qing Dynasty, and during this era, Chinese civilization would reach new heights. The year 1644 saw the beginning of the Xunzhi reign of the Qing dynasty. In Chinese, Xunzhi means complying with the bidding of heaven and the wishes of the people in order to bring full order to the country. But in reality, half of the country was ravaged by war and floods, and the newly established Qing dynasty found itself in a dire situation. The imperial court had little choice but to adopt desperate measures in order to consolidate its power. In its later years, the preceding dynasty, the Ming dynasty, had been constantly troubled by wars, and as a result, various water conservancy works had fallen into disrepair. Inevitably, there were serious floods. At the time, the course of the lower reaches of the Yellow River ran from Henan province into Jiangsu province, and joined the Huaihe River and the Grand Canal near the city of Huaiyin. The Grand Canal cut through the Huaihe River from south to north to flow further north in a 90-kilometer long section of the Yellow River. Silt brought down by the Yellow River was choking its course, and the long neglected dikes were giving way, causing flooding. Because three major water systems were connected in a complicated, if not untidy way, whenever the Yellow River overflowed, its waters brought disaster to the Grand Canal, the Huaihe River, and Hongzhe Lake. During the 16 years from 1662 to 1678, floods caused 67 large breaches in the Yellow River, on average, for a year. The common people were suffering, and the imperial court had reason to be concerned about its stability. The Qing Imperial Court turned its full attention to water conservancy, and all along the Yellow River, people were mustered to work on the river dikes. Making improvements to the flow of the Yellow River was a heavy responsibility, but it was one that simply had to be taken up. Mm -hmm. 
During the reign of Qing Dynasty Emperor Kangxi, water conservancy experts summed up the experience and knowledge of their predecessors and came up with a two-pronged strategy. The first involved leading clear water into the Yellow River to wash away the silt deposited on the riverbed so as to increase the flood discharge of the river. The second part involved digging a diversion course for the Yellow River at the juncture of the Yellow River, the Grand Canal and the Huaihe River. This plan aimed at preventing the silty water of the Yellow River from damaging and blocking the Grand Canal. The strategy put in place to remedy problems on the Yellow River was innovative and, in the end, it was highly effective. The untidy Yellow River and Huaihe River water system inherited from the Ming Dynasty was sorted out and transportation on the Grand Canal was greatly improved. Yolio 战略举措 Through its measures for curbing floods from the Yellow River, the newly established Qing dynasty proved its administrative ability and its sincere desire to work for the benefit of the common people. In the 1680s, government officials and thousands of workers devoted their wisdom and labour to reinforcing the Yellow River dikes. They were carrying out an essential mission brought upon them by the times in which they lived. The Manchus who founded the Qing dynasty were originally a nomadic people in northeast China, but now they had to learn to control water because the central plain they were ruling was a farming region crisscrossed with rivers. All the previous rulers of China had understood the importance of water conservancy and the Manchus had to inherit this tradition if they wanted to integrate themselves with the civilization of the Central Plain. All the feudal regimes in China regarded flood control and construction of water conservancy projects as a basic task that had to be carried out in order to maintain social order and bring benefit to the people. The Qing dynasty did likewise, following the principle that the throne and official posts depend on the rise or fall of the water of the Yellow River, and the security of the Qing Empire depends on the satisfaction or dissatisfaction of the common people. By the 45th year of the rule of the Qing Empire, the wild waters of the Yellow and Huaihe rivers had been brought under control, the dikes had been reinforced so they could fulfill the task they were meant to, the threat of floods had been greatly reduced and transportation on the Grand Canal was totally unimpeded. On the ninth day of the second month of the lunar year in the year 1689, a sacrificial ceremony of the highest grade was held at the mausoleum of Yu the Great. At the ceremony, the Qing Emperor and court ministers pledged themselves to follow the example of Yu the Great and devote all their energies to the control of floods. Yu the Great was a legendary man of remote antiquity who, when given the responsibility of bringing a massive deluge under control, was so devoted to his task that he refused to enter his own home even when he passed it three times. The Qing imperial ministers worshipped Yu the Great and wanted to build a flood control system that would be as effective as the one he had put in place. His <laughs> 他会采取一季可能的措施，包括学习汉中原文化，真心诚意的学习中原儒家文化，这是清朝中间一个很重大的创新点。所以康乾盛世，康乾盛世我们说他是我们讲他是以中国儒家文化为主体的中国传统文化
Such practical initiatives as the Water Conservancy projects went a long way to consolidating Qing power. The Imperial Court was also keen to build up its position by ideological means too. To this end, the principle of respecting Confucius and reading the Confucian classics was stressed to lay a foundation for a unified national culture. This is the temple of Confucius in Chufu in Shandong province. Many kings and emperors in feudal China made special trips here to pay homage to Confucius, but the emperors of the Qing dynasty made the ceremony of sacrifice to Confucius even more special. When Emperor Kangxi arrived at the shrine of Confucius and paid respect to the great master of Chinese culture, it was with the highest level ritual. He knelt down three times and kowtowed nine times. He then wrote an inscription concerning Confucius which read, Model of Virtue and Learning. He went even further by paying respect to the tomb of Confucius in the most solemn manner. The sincere respect Emperor Kangxi was showing for Confucius was meant to convince the scholars of the Han ethnic majority that he had come to pay homage to Confucius not only as the new ruler of China, but also as a genuine disciple of Confucius. He was holding the grand ceremony to show that he had totally integrated himself with traditional Chinese culture. Confucian teachings had dominated mainstream ideology in China since the Han Dynasty 2000 years ago. From its founding,